Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to this talk. Um, the other day, which was in the end of May 2025, I was asked to give the keynote talk at the NIH NCI retreat on AI of pancreatic cancer. I gave a talk on that topic six years before, which led to some of the discussion and grant work, and so they asked me to kind of bring it back six years later and take a look at where we are and is AI the light at the end of the tunnel and what I'm going to share with you here is all the work we've done with the support of the Lust Garden Foundation well maybe not all the work but a lot of the work and also a lot of work we're doing with Juan Ferez and his team at the Microsoft AI for Good Lab. I'm not going to go into incredible detail on all the topics that would take me several days and some of the stuff it's cutting edge we don't even have all the answers and other things we have the answers but I don't understand it so let's get started I started with five slides that say when we look from 2019 when I gave my first talk to today there's no doubt there's increasing interest in detection of pancreatic cancer around the globe Articles, meetings in China, Taiwan, Korea, England, and Europe, like the Panorama Trauma uh, Challenge, all kind of tell you that everybody is interested in this very important disease. On the side of industry, work is being done at Microsoft, NVIDIA, Google, and the main manufacturers like Siemens and GE and Canon, and many other companies, which I'm not mentioning. Progress. There are algorithms which have undergone some testing. Think of the Panorama test. Think about some of the work from places in China. Optimizing protocols for scan acquisition on large data sets, perhaps so that these algorithms can work across multiple scanners in multiple institutions. And in some situations, data sharing and testing is beginning. The downside and the reality, there's no product or product of suite that um, is in clinical practice today. And when I say a suite of products, I mean there is AI available in mammography, this AI for pulmonary emboli, this AI for lung nodule detection that are all FDA approved and multiple different companies are selling uh, products, but not with pancreatic cancer. Now, it's not really the FDA's fault, but we'll see what happens and how well the FDA is able to pass these new rules and regulations as we look at the future. And then, of course, there's no reimbursement for AI of the pancreas because first, you need to have something that really works. So Felix 2, that's where we are. It's this effort between us, Hopkins Radiology, Microsoft AI, and the Lust Garden Foundation, with the goal is using all the tools at our disposal to detect pancreatic cancer at an earlier state where we can manage the disease better. Remember, if you can pick things up with pancreatic cancer at stage one or stage two, survival becomes 60% and not 11 or 12%. We've put a lot of work in that uh, slide has a slight typo. This is 2025. We've already segmented 14,500 data sets, and I am doing my Lust Garden update due June 1st, which is actually today, and it's really 15,500, and we keep adding cases on on a daily basis. We've spent a lot of time looking at the problems. A couple good articles by Satomi Kawamoto making the point that when tumors are small, they're hard to see, and when they're seen nine months later, the patient goes from resectable to unresectable. Or in this case, where there is a mildly dilated pancreatic duct, which was ignored, and then four months later, the duct is bigger and the mass is very obvious. So because we are radiologists and we know what the problems are, that helps us design the AI products to help meet those needs. So what do we need to do? We need 3D mapping to visualize CT volumes rather than slices. And one of the things we've been working on, of course, is cinematic rendering. We're writing a bunch of new articles. We've spoken about that before. 
but we're trying to see tissue differences when it's very subtle to pick up small tumors. And again, we're trying to not think about just picking up masses. Perhaps when it's a mass, it's too late. Subtle texture changes will be a lot better. And also, what we want to do is improve the CT data for processes like radiomics. So one of the things we're looking at is everyone uses different reconstruction algorithms, usually have some smoothing or edge enhancement, because that what makes the images look better and perhaps easier for us to read. But all of those features perhaps actually hurt the data when you look at it from a radiomics perspective. Radiomics is the computer. The computer is very smart. Perhaps the computer doesn't need to have this post-processing. And if we only looked at the raw images, perhaps it would make it easier to be able to develop algorithms that are more sensitive, but also that work across multiple vendors. And we get around many of the problems that radiomics and AI will typically have. Just a couple quick examples, subtle mass in the head of the pancreas right there. And you could see it nicely on the cinematic where it's textural change. And yes, you could see it on both studies, but that lesion, which is in fact better seen on the coronal cinematic, was missed about two months earlier. And you could see this textural change really nicely shows you the tumor. Now, what else? What about this case? Well, in this case, what are you seeing? Well, you're seeing a dilated pancreatic duct, and if you look carefully, it looks like there's something going on in the pancreatic duct, right? And so you want to see and look at the duct and the transition right there. And then you could see at that point, when you look at the cinematic, there's definite textural changes going beyond simply seeing the duct. And by showing those textural changes, we know there's a tumor present. And when you do the 3D cinematic rendering with an anterior approach and really good shading, look at the pancreatic duct. Look at the transition right here. This is normal appearing gland. This is abnormal. So textural changes, dilated duct, all the things that we can do to pick up tumors earlier. And we're working hard on that. Or in this third case, dilated pancreatic duct, lesion in the body of the pancreas, right, right there. Again, transition of the duct, low density, not a difficult case, but just to show you how it looks with the cinematic rendering. So you get a good feel of exactly what is going on in this case. Just a really nice example. And here's one more set of images. So we are working on cinematic rendering. The goal is to not just have the radiologist be able to create the images, which takes time, experience, and potentially bias, but to teach the computer how to create the images. And in that sense, if the computer creates the images, more people will be able to use it. So I think one of the things we're speaking about is being able to have computer-generated imaging. That becomes very, very important. And it's been done for things like knee fractures, but that's easier. It's much harder to look at the texture of a pancreas and have the computer choose the right parameters, but it's something we're looking at. Now, the next thing is radiomics. Now, what radiomics is, if you think about you and me looking at a scan, we're looking for changes in density. Think about those pancreatic masses I showed you. We're looking for changes in shape and size. But with radiomics, what the computer is doing is looking at the raw data, looking at the X's and O's, and trying to find changes that are meaningful. With radiomics, we actually can analyze 50,000 or even more parameters. And we'll do that to start, but then get down to the critical parameters that help us make specific decisions. Is the pancreas normal or abnormal? Is there a mass present? What kind of mass is it? A cyst, a neuroendocrine tumor, a pancreatic adenocarcinoma. And we also use radiomics as a way of predicting response to chemotherapy and response to surgery, which are all works in progress, but have really, really, really good potential. So that becomes a very important part of what we're doing. Now, 
here's a good article on radiomics, but it makes the point how you need to look at the data and come up with features. This is why we mentioned the importance of having good data, but also not having data with too many filters because the filters change the data. So we think if we look at native raw data, which maybe isn't as pleasing to you and me just looking at it, maybe to the computer, it will be actually a lot better. So when we did the initial work on radiomics for pancreatic cancer, this article by Linda Chu, what we showed is how we looked at different parameters, shape, textures, filters, and the like. And what we were able to do is look and find a fingerprint. And we found that a tumor looks different than a normal gland. And so you're now thinking about the texture appearance and the fingerprint. Can we find a fingerprint that has pancreatic cancer? And in that study, we were like 99% accurate. Really impressive results. Now, again, it was normal versus abnormal, but still, this random forest classifier was really, really good. And we've shown this radiomics works really nicely. Shape features are extracted from the 3D surface of the region of interest. Texture features are calculated in three dimensions, considering the correlation of signal intensities of adjacent voxels. And you go on and on. So it's really mathematical analysis of the CT scan. Now we talk about early detection, but from the Mayo Clinic, they looked at pre-diagnostic scans. That is scans done one to three years before the patient presented. And they were able in many cases to find the tumor simply by doing radiomics. Radiomics-based models can detect PDAC from normal pancreas when it's beyond human interrogation capability. In this study, they had radiologists knowing the patient had pancreatic cancer, looking at the scans, and they still could not find the patient's tumor. So that indeed becomes very, very important. And this idea about building neural networks for segmenting normal and abnormal glands becomes very important because when you do radiomics, the first thing you need to do is outline the pancreatic gland. If you can't find the gland or can't find it accurately, then the radiomics is not going to be very accurate. And this article by Satomi Kawamoto went a long way in showing some of the difficulties in having the computer automatically segment the pancreas, particularly when pathology is present, but showed also that we can do it, that our study found that segmentation of the pancreas using deep neural networks was accurate. And we have shown that you're able to do this in the majority of cases. Now, it's not going to be perfect in every case. We're trying to make it better and better. But in some cases, the radiologist or technologist will have to get involved. Now, we've been working to do this better with Microsoft Again, trying to teach the computer to be able to find the pancreas precisely. And in this study, we compared our programs with that of four expert readers, two radiologists and two technologists with lots of training on segmenting pancreatic cancer. And when you look at their findings, there was some difference between the best and the worst, though all were excellent at segmenting the gland. But you can see when you did the dice score and you compare the computer to the humans, the computer was actually as good or better. The computer failed one or two percent of the time. Patients with fatty pancreas, patients with poor tissue planes could be more challenging, but it was a small percent and the variation in those cases with with, pay, with the um, studies being done by the radiologist is there as well. So ideally, it would be wonderful if the computer in 95% or more of the time can really be very accurate showing you the pancreas. And in two to 5% of the time, you would have to go in and support the computer. Now, again, as long as the computer would tell you it's not accurate, it would be a good thing to do. Now, the importance of segmentation cannot be overemphasized because if you look at this study, this shows that the better the segmentation, the more robust the um, radiomics is. And if you don't have good segmentation, the radiomics 
will be very poor. So again, very, very important. And of course, the way we think about it is in a pipeline. We want to minimize the role of the radiologist or technologist. Once the patient is scanned, we want all of these processes, including lesion detection, classification, and analysis to happen automatically. And the radiologist downstream, while looking at the case, will be able to see what the computer says and will do better than ever. So there's a lot that goes on in that regard. Now, of course, the other task is being able to recognize tumor. And we've put a lot of effort in, of course, to being able to detect tumor and detect the dilated pancreatic duct. One of the things we know as radiologists is sometimes tumors are very large, they're very easy. Sometimes tumors are very small, they're more difficult. With smaller tumors, the best thing and only thing you may see is a dilated pancreatic duct. So one of the things we're working on is being able to use AI to analyze the pancreatic duct, define if it's dilated or not, define where the transition is and so where the tumor might be. Also, we want to analyze inside the duct. Can we look in the duct with patients with IPMNs, for example, or, can or potential cancer, or any process with a dilated duct? Can we look inside the duct and predict the process that is going on? So I'd like to speak to you a little bit more about looking at the pancreatic duct, but I see we're kind of running a bit late. Let's take a break, let's come back, and we'll start from there. See you in a few minutes. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.